Super. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully, day two of reInvent is treating you all really well. Uh, so, my name is Prabhu Bharati. I'm a technical public cloud specialist here at VMware. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is next gen apps because it's cool. <laughs> you're all here at reInvent because you're likely looking at either replatforming or rearchitecting some of your architectural frameworks. So, what we're going to talk about is just some general things we're, uh, things we're noticing in the marketplace around this topic, and uh, we'll kind of uh, look at why VMware is important and why you should look at VMware for some of these uh, things in this, in this space, right? So one of the key drivers that we look at when we look at next generation apps is what is actually driving this at the end of the day? It's the ability to actually do something like you want to have your competitive advantage at the end of the day. And the way you're going to get that competitive advantage is actually not by buying like off-the-shelf products in the most cases. And I'll give you a very simple example. Like, just walk down Maker Faire, right? This this uh, the road right here. What do you see out here? Everything is kind of custom built. It's built for a very custom purpose, and you want to drive innovation and disruption at the end of the day in whatever you're trying to build. And that's what you want to actually get to. But how do you get there at the end of the day? The way you get there is by kind of optimizing your software development processes that you want to kind of set up there, right? If you look at the way we've traditionally done a, a software development in, in most cases, it kind of goes through a, a sequence of events. Now, the biggest question mark or the, the how is really what most people kind of always struggle with. And what we find in the most cases, the how is really the most debated question in IT. If you ever ask anyone, like, how do we actually go build this thing? You look at different answers based on who you ask at the end of the day. You want to use containers, I want to use a PaaS platform. Uh, depending on what the software developer actually wants, you have more than uh, n number of ways to kind of solve for something like this. But the ultimate goal, what is the ultimate goal you want to get to is basically saying, hey, I want to have consistency, I want to have repeatability in my release cycle uh, at the end of the day, right? That's, where, that's the kind of the foundational piece of your CI CD framework that you want to lay down and how you want to do it. Now think about it this way, like if I can replicate and make sure that my test staging prod, everything goes through exactly the same way, that's my kind of my foundational points of how I want to actually lay this down from a software development perspective. Now, one of the key ways that you kind of do this and what we've found is uh, one of the technologies that's leading this charter is containers, right? Uh, you're all here, so I'm assuming you all are fairly familiar with container technology at this point. <laughs> right? So what is the, why, do, why is that people have actually taken to containers in a, in a big way? Is mainly because, number one, it's fast, it's lightweight, and it's portable, right? You can take, take it to multiple, uh, multiple endpoints, and you can move from test dev to prod in a very, very easy, seamless manner. Now, the key use cases that we see for container frameworks is really around building it for uh, a developer sandbox. That's the simplest one that you can think of. You develop it on your on your laptop. It's the same experience when you move it to a, a public cloud endpoint or so on and so forth. You can also use this to containerize existing applications, right? You can simplify, improve developer workflow, and also build it for cloud native applications. So if you, if you heard of 12-factor apps, I'm not going to go through all the 12-factor apps in the interest of time here, but that's kind of the principle of why do you want to get to containers in the beginning, right? And for the most part, if you go look at who are the, the two key things that are kind of leading the, the marketplace in this, in this space, is number one is you can either do uh, Docker containers one at a time uh, on your laptop, or you can, do, you can orchestrate multiple containers using something like Kubernetes. Uh, if you pull up your catalog for reInvent and just do EKS or Kubernetes, I'm sure you'll find more than, more than the number of sessions you can do it just this week, right? But if you're interested, there's a link up there. If you've never seen Kubernetes, there's a nice five-minute video that'll give you a quick primer on what Kubernetes is, right? So it'll kind of give you the framework of how you want to get started. But that's, that's kind of setting the stage. But now if you go take a step back and say, what is the right abstraction for my developers, right? If I look at this from a pure IaaS perspective, I can give you an IaaS API. Is that sufficient for you? 
that basically means that, hey, you're going to build your own app platform, or you, you have traditional monolithic applications, and you're going to build this on an IaaS-based platform, right? That's your, that's your choice that you can go do this. I'll give you an API for an IaaS, and you go build everything else kind of on top of it. Or I can give you a Docker API. I give you a Docker API, and then you give me container hosts. And I can use that as my, as my endpoint at that point. I build my application containers. I build the application dependencies. I also build out the container orchestrator that I need to kind of use there. The Docker host itself is what is maintained by IT, but everything else that kind of goes and stacks on top of it is all being built and managed by your, uh, your IT staff, right? Now, the other way to do this is containers as a service, where I basically leverage something like either EKS or PKS from VMware or uh, PKS, uh, Cloud PKS from, uh, from VMware, where I can basically leverage all the stuff that I, I talked about in the previous step, but everything is delivered to me as a service, where every, it's basically delivering containers and Kubernetes as a service for me. The next step out of that is I go to complete full-blown full PaaS platform, right? In that case, I'm looking at something like, say, Pivotal Cloud Foundry or, or something like that, where it's literally saying, hey, you take, I take the code, I give it to a PaaS platform, it takes care of everything for me. But what is the difference here? What you're really looking at is going from more control and complexity to less control in, at the end of the day. So it's a wide spectrum if you look at it, right? So depending on which end of the spectrum you are, you are in, your, uh, in your software development lifecycle, you can kind of look at this in that spectrum and figure out, hey, what kind of makes sense for me? Do I need more control on my infrastructure or do I need less? I'm okay with giving up that control of my infrastructure and going to a PaaS or a container as a service kind of uh, abstraction layer at the end of the day. So there are multiple ways that you can also package and run more clothes and move it into the cloud at the end of the day. Now, since you're here, because the two folks here said, yes, what is a container? <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just kidding you. But there's a ton of different ways that you can take and package your application and move it to the cloud. Now, obviously, containers is something we talked about. You have event-driven functions. If you're looking at, say, Lambda functions, right? Can I just take my, my, my code and take it and run it as a Lambda function? Yeah, you can. But is it really going to make sense for your traditional application? Maybe, maybe not. Microservices, the hot buzzword out there, and if you've not heard it since morning for the first, if I'm the first one saying this today, <laughs> there is actually a problem. <laughs> but, but that's the, the beauty of this, right? You want to, in the, at the end of the day, you want to break this up into small uh, consumable pieces, and you have different ways of kind of, uh, kind of getting to that same uh, endpoint at the end of the day. Now, same like before, if you look at uh, the, the public cloud itself, the IaaS layer is really your public cloud infrastructure. You can run it on AWS. AWS offers you multiple different ways to do this. You can do your container platform, container orchestrator, you have a PaaS layer, or you can go serverless, right? The goal ultimately is to pick the right runtime that you need for the, for the, for the workload that you're trying to do. So if you're trying to do something like Alexa, for example, if you're trying to do a voice-based service, you're going to look at like event driven functions. You're looking at a much more old school ERP system, you're probably going to use either, you're going to look at something like containers to do that, or something in that, that realm of the things. Now, how you break this down is ultimately up to how you want the application to function at the end of the day. Now, if I look at this from a developer's perspective, how do I pick the right job for the tool, right? In this case, if I look at a container orchestrator, the developer, what he's, he or she is providing is really the container, right? Everything else, the tool is providing, saying the container scheduling, the primitives for networking, routing, some of the, all that stuff. If, I look at, if I'm looking at this from an application platform perspective, or a PaaS platform perspective, I'm providing you an application. What the PaaS layer is providing you is the container orchestrator and everything that kind of goes along with it. If I'm looking at this from a serverless perspective, what I'm providing you is a function. The, the, so if I take Lambda, for example, I'm providing it the code, I'm providing it the Lambda functions, everything else is provided by Lambda, and all the scheduling and everything underneath it is provided by that. And the IaaS layer at that point is just uh, kind of abstracted from you. You're not really looking at the IaaS layer at that point at all, right? Now again, if you go look at this from a spectrum perspective, you're going from a, uh, from a lower complexity to higher efficiency. Obviously, running things in a serverless form factor provides its own inherent uh, efficiencies in terms of cost and being able to optimize for all of that, but it's also more labor intensive, right? If you're trying to replatform an application that has historically not been there, 
it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to uh, do that in a serverless form factor. But guess if it's a uh, if it's a net new application, sure, that's the best way to kind of do it. But it also obviously gives you, from a flexibility standpoint, you're looking at much more flexible options on the far left-hand side, but then you're also looking at lower standardization. Every, if everyone is developing on their laptop, it's not a lot of standardization that you can drive into the, into the platform at that point, right? Now, if I look at this from an application perspective, if I kind of go back and say, hey, if I look at this and say, hey, what do I need from a greenfield perspective, or how do I go enhance it for a brownfield perspective, there are obviously a different set of challenges where that come up with it in different cases. Now, if it's a greenfield, it's great. I can actually do a CI CD pipeline right off the bat. I can do testing. I can do a lot of consistency. I can drive a lot of that stuff out of, right out of the gate. I don't have to uh, kind of go backwards and do a lot of those things. But if I'm looking at this from a brownfield perspective, how do I, the biggest question marks that a lot of people have is, hey, how do I roll out new, new versions of an application? Versioning is something that was probably not thought out very well. So those kind of things kind of take time, and it's much more difficult for us to do with a brownfield application. Now, uh, the hard thing that I heard with a lot of my customers is also the ability to do replatforming versus modernization, right? Uh, the biggest question mark in a lot of people's head is, hey, do I just lift and shift into a cloud-based platform, or do I actually modernize? There are inherent, obviously, uh, there are inherent benefits to actually doing a full-blown modernization because you get to do things like blue-green deploys, you can do auto-healing, you can do scaling, you can do a lot of different things when you do, uh, when you actually go Replatform and actually go and do a full-blown modernization effort, but sometimes, for for various reasons, you have to end up with lifting and shifting something into a public cloud-based platform, right? So anyway, that's kind of all very generic. Like, why why does this matter to us? Like, why is VMware looking at this in the first place? And why is a guy from VMware VMware talking about all of these things? So. From that perspective, what we're really trying to solve for with our VMware Cloud Services is really solving for three main challenges at the end of the day. So number one is, if I'm looking at it from a hybrid IT perspective, if I have on-premises, I have public cloud resources, I need to be able to consolidate and provide a consistent management experience for my, end, and my hybrid IT users, that's one of the use cases that we're trying to solve for. If I have a full-blown cloud IT team, I need to be able to provide things like automation, cost compliance, cost analysis, compliance. Uh, I need to get insights on how my, my platform is actually running in the public cloud, right? Those are the kind of things I want to do. If I have an app-based platform team that is looking at doing this from a DevOps perspective, I want to be able to provide Kubernetes as a dial tone experience. I don't need to be able to, I need to be able to provide this in a very much more seamless way for my end users, where they go and they request a cluster and they're ready to go. Well, that's, what, that's the kind of experience that we're trying to go for. And the Vimmer Cloud Services portfolio is really solving for these broad three key use cases at this point. And ultimately what we want to do is bring them in, into an integrated ecosystem of products that we can basically leverage across these different endpoints and being able to provide a seamless experience regardless of where you want to end up with, right? The, the key, key thing there is, and you'll hear this over and over from us, is the fact that we want to be able to provide a, consistency, and B, developer freedom, right? Like, if you go and choose to build it in Kubernetes, that's totally fine. We want to be able to provide that seamless experience at the end of the day, right? So how do we do this from an operations perspective? So there's four main, uh, main products that we use for operationalizing for public clouds. So the first one for cost and compliance is cloud health. Uh, we obviously, given the time that we have here, I don't think we'll be able to get into each of these in a lot of detail. But feel free; I'm going to be here for a lot of, for a lot longer. But we'll definitely chat more in person if you guys are interested. But number one is cloud health. What cloud health is able to provide you is the cost compliance visibility into your public cloud-based workloads. Wavefront is providing you the ability to do time series metrics. Secure State is giving you the ability to look at uh, event detection for public cloud-based workloads again. And Cloud Automation Services is a suite of products that, that go from ranging from uh, blueprinting your workloads all the way to a CI CD platform, right? The whole spectrum of things. And all of these are going to be available across multiple cloud platforms at the end of the day. And so it goes back to my point of, A, you want to have developer, developer freedom. If you choose to develop on other platforms, we want you to be able to do it, not just these sphere based platforms at the end of the day, right? So if I look at this from a uh, from a from an automation perspective, for hybrid cloud and multi cloud perspective, like I said, that there are three uh, umbrella products that kind of uh, fit into that ecosystem. So there's number one is called Cloud Assembly. Cloud Assembly is your infrastructure as code based platform. 
Then you have Service Broker, which is your catalog service that provides you a, the ability to bring in uh, templates from other cloud providers, and then you have CodeStream, which is for your continuous delivery uh, pipeline-based uh, approach for that one, right? So if I now take this and say, hey, if I look at this, how do I break this down? There are a lot of different products. How do I actually tie all of these together and make sense of all of these things, right? If I take a scenario where I need to, as a cloud administrator, I want to be able to um, secure and effectively uh, secure and cost effectively manage my developer and my, my my development teams environments in AWS. How do I kind of do that, right? Uh, if I want to basically secure EC2 instances, if I want to deploy uh, Kubernetes environments out in AWS, if I want to manage the status of resources, how do I kind of do all of these things? There are individual services that are able to now address the individual points that I kind of mentioned. So if I'm looking at doing something like blueprinting, for example, that I mentioned, I'd leverage our cloud assembly service. If I want to deploy and manage Kubernetes in an easy way, uh, a fully managed Kubernetes service, we, we provide you the ability to do that through our VMware Cloud PKS platform, where we'll go and deploy the Kubernetes clusters, we'll manage all the, all the infrastructure that goes along with it in a public cloud-based platform of your cho choice, right? Now, if I need to manage the uh, status of the resources, if I need to look at security, if I need to look at cost metrics, things like that, I can use a combination of Cloud Health, Secure State, and Wavefront to get insight into what the users are actually going and deploying in AWS at that point, right? Now, if I flip this over and say, if I'm looking at this from a developer's perspective, I want to do, I want to say, my, one of my teams wants to go and deploy an application in uh, using Amazon EC2 instances, and then I have another one that's going to do Kubernetes. How do I do this on both sides? You're leveraging a CI CD based platform, right? Here, now I can leverage Wavefront as my platform to get statistics both on my Kubernetes clusters, my EC2 instances, my AWS infrastructure itself. And if I want to leverage all of this and wrap a CI CD framework around it, I can do that using VMware CodeStream. So I can automate that whole pipeline from end to end and leverage something like that. If I'm looking at this from a day two perspective, if I look at this across cost, security compliance, and Wavefront, I have individual products that can kind of also tailor made that are tailor made for ex exploring those uh, those those use cases at that point, right? So if I'm looking at simply like Cloud Health, for example, provides me the in it, what Cloud Health is able to do is now expose the cost that a specific resource is using. For example, if I have a team of resource a team of developers who are going and deploying some stuff in AWS, now I have the ability to actually pull and also show them that hey, you're actually deploying. Uh, these metrics out in uh, AWS, I want you to go right size some of these resources. You have, you have EIPs that you haven't uh, leveraged, or I can go and provide uh, metrics that can either right size the VMs, right size the EC2 instances, that kind of stuff. With secure state, something like security and compliance. If I go and put a, uh, an EC2 instance out there with no secure, with a, any, any allow security group, I want to be able to be alerted for something like that, right? If I go and put out a security, if I go and put out a security group which allows SSH access from everywhere on the internet, I want to be alerted on things like that. And I also want to be alerted on things like which are going to be of connected nature at the end of the day. Because if you think about it, it's not just the one threat vector at the end of the day in, 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 like, in something like a public cloud. If I'm using the same key, suppose across all my instances and that key is exposed, it's not just that key and that instance that is now that, that are now vulnerable. I have a whole set of resources that are connected that are now actually vulnerable at the end of the day. So Secure State is able to look at not just individual threat vectors like that, but also draw out this entire connected threat pattern for you and say, hey, you may want to go and look at all of these resources that, that are likely affected. If I look at this from an operations perspective now and say, hey, if I want to get time series metrics and I want to be able to pinpoint things where when an event is happening, and not just when it is happening, but also correlate that with something, right? If I go and push a code, if I go and push code into my, into, uh, into my AWS instances, and then suddenly everything drops, I need to know what happened. It's not just the fact that I put this thing in, the code deploy was the trigger for it, but what actually happened? Was there a garbage collection that went, went up? Was there a database instance that started doing it? Being able to correlate these two, two different, uh, two seemingly disparate things into one, uh, one platform, that's the kind of stuff that Wavefront's able to now build out for you, right? So just wrapping up sort of, you have, uh, end of the day, the, the key takeaway here is that Regardless of if, it, if this is for a cloud administrator or for a cloud developer, we have different uh, we have different solutions that can cater to those uh, those different uh, uh, teams at the end of the day. 
Now, if I want to look at this from a pure cloud operations perspective, now again, if I'm doing this, regardless of if I'm, if I'm doing this in a VM-based approach, or I'm doing this in a container-based approach, like I said, we have the ability to now look at very granular metrics for in the individual operations uh, frameworks. So we talked about this uh, platform called cloud, VMware Cloud PKS. Ultimately, what uh, just quick primer on this for, so that you guys kind of, kind of get why, why this is important in this is because this is kind of the fundamental piece of all of this thing. Like, if you think about it, this is where you kind of go build your applications at the end of the day if you're leveraging Kubernetes, right? So here, the biggest differentiators is that number one is that this platform is built ground up to be multi-cloud ready. So if you're going to be leveraging AWS as your primary uh, cloud provider, we give you the option to actually go leverage VMware Cloud PKS to actually go deploy your Kubernetes clusters out in AWS resources, connect back to AWS resources. If you want to learn more about VMware Cloud PKS, definitely come back to our code session. We have someone who will kind of give you a more in-depth look at this. Uh, we're also leveraging things which are a little bit interesting here. We're leveraging something called smart clusters, which, uh, which helps optimize these public cloud resources and consumption of the master and worker nodes at the end of the day. We give you a very robust uh, policy control framework. And at the end of the day, if you're leveraging AWS, native AWS resources, if you're leveraging RDS, S3, whatever you may have, we have abilities to connect back into native AWS resources for this and then they give you the ability to leverage Kubernetes as a service in a public cloud endpoint, right? And not just that, if you now want to take advantage of the broad ecosystem that uh, Kubernetes is offering to you, if you want to leverage Istio Service Mesh, if you want to leverage Prometheus, FluentD, Zipkin, whatever you may have, you now have the ability to do that as well, right? So our team is focused heavily on this platform, so if you want to learn more, we're happy to chat with you and uh, uh, discuss this in more more details. But like I said at the beginning, there's almost like three pillars of the VMware Cloud PKS. Number one is, like I said, the Kubernetes ecosystem that it obviously hooks into. The ability to hook into native public cloud resources and also our own cloud services that are going to provide you the option to uh, leverage Wavefront, get cost metrics, get logging metrics and things like that, right? So it gives you a lot of flexibility to do all of that. So. If you're super excited and you want to really go and try all of these things, uh, using this is extremely easy. We try to make this as simple and easy as, as, as we can. Please go to cloud.vmware.com. Uh, all of these services are available as a trial. You can go and trial this right, right now. Uh, if you have time, <laughs> you're more than welcome to go trial this right away. Uh, for the Kubernetes engine, I will say we, we are offering a $150 credit for the, for, the, for the rest of the year. So please go take advantage of that. Uh, as you as you can, and thank you, thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, hopefully, this was useful. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around to chat with you guys. Thank you so much.